Okay, so last video we talked about how um, we can use Reynolds transport theorem to keep track of something called B, right? Which we don't really know what it is, but it's per unit mass, whatever it is. Um, and the way we keep track of it is we say that the rate of change of B in our system is equal to uh, the rate of change of B in our CV, within our CV, plus the rate of change of B, that, or the rate at which B crosses our CV boundary. Um, so now if we set B equal to mass, um, if our system is a defined amount of fluid, right? So if our system is like the fluid in our bathtub, for example, or let's say all of the atmosphere, what is the rate of change of mass with time? in our system. Well, remember what I said is that the system includes all of the fluid we ever want to care about. So that should never change with time because we've already defined our fluid, defined our system to include all of the fluid, right? So our rate of change of our mass of our system with time is gonna be equal to zero. Okay, um, another way to think about this is, let's say you define your system as your bathtub, but then you put a child in there and it starts splashing water out all over into your um, uh, bathroom. Um, well, then it appears as though water is leaving your system because you defined your system as, as solely your bathtub. But then that means you defined your system poorly because water is leaving that system and your system should include all of the fluid at all times even if it gets splashed out of there by by a little kid so you're um have to expand your definition of your system literally until um it always includes all of your mass that you care about all the liquid that you sorry not mass all the fluid that you care about um so in which case even if there's a kid in your excuse me in your bathtub splashing everywhere it's your change in mass of your system, because now you've expanded it to your entire bathroom, is going to be equal to zero. So we can now write the Reynolds transport theorem as zero, favorite number in all of engineering, is equal to d dt, the rate of change of, we're going to integrate over our control volume in order to find the amount of our density integrated over our volume. Because remember, b if our uh, capital B is mass, our little b, which is mass per mass, is going to be equal to 1. So it's actually literally 1 times rho. Plus, integral over our control, sis, uh, sorry, control surface, Cs, time, um, of rho times um, 1, because our b is equal to 1, times our v dot n hat dA. Okay? So this is the rate of change of mass in our control volume. And this is the rate at which mass is carried over the boundary. And that can be either positive, both of these can be positive or negative. Awesome. Okay, so um, how are unsteady effects measured? Well, we can, um, if, if we look at this, uh, there's a d dt of the integral of rho, which is a function, remember, because we're doing an Eulerian perspective of x, y, z, and t, dv. This is the sum of all the mass in our control volume, and this is the rate of change of mass with time. Right, so if we have a steady state, um, steady state situation, the rate of change of anything in a steady state situation is zero, right? 
So we can write, if it's steady state, this is wonderful, d dt. We're going to write this equation over and over again so you guys get it like muscle memory memorized. dv plus the integral over control surface of rho v dot n hat dA. Um, this is going to be zero under steady state, which means that the net amount of material passing across our boundary of our control volume has to be zero. Now, fluid can be entering and fluid can be entering, exiting, but this just means that the amount of fluid entering and the amount of fluid exiting has to be the same. That's all that means. Our, so the net amount of stuff crossing our fluid boundary has to be zero. Our control volume boundary has to be zero. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the surface integral in more detail. Okay. We've talked about this in the last video, but I really want to to hammer this home. Take a moment and try to tell me what is a cross product, not cross product, what is a dot product, why am I writing cross? What is a dot product in words? Okay. Go ahead, okay. So now hopefully you've tried to write it down here um, if I had to write it out, I would say um, component of, let's say we have A dotted into B, um, is a component of B parallel to A multiplied by A and the magnitude taken. It's kind of an awkward way to say it. In fact, I encourage you to rewrite that and say it in a less awkward way. Because remember, that's engaged learning. Trying to write this in your own words, in your own um, phrasing, and, and, and in a way that makes more sense to you is, is, is going to stick at a minimum two-thirds times better. Right? Because remember we said if you do engaged note-taking, you, you, you have to study two-thirds times less, 60% less you have to study. It's, it's great. It's great. Okay, so um, there's that dot product. And remember the dot product shows up, in, in, integral over our control volume of rho v dot n hat dA. This dot product shows up right in the middle of our integral. So that is a, a vector operation that we have to take care of, usually before we can even do the integral. We have to take care of the dot product. And then what this dA tells us is that this is summed over the control volume surface. And if, uh, which means, right, the summed part is important. I think there's an extra M there. Um, the summed part is important because each face can be a separate integral. And um, just a side note, if we're doing it right, for most of the problems we give you, most, not all, most of the problems we give you, you won't have to do the integrals, okay? Some you will, but most you won't. Okay, so let's look at this really quick and practice our dot product before we start practicing our, our sums, our integrals. Um, if we practice our dot product, our unit normal is pointing in this direction in red. And then we have V2, which is parallel to it, V4, which is different by some uh, amount theta, V1, which is perpendicular to it, and V3, which is in the opposite direction. So if we look, VI dot N hat, well, VI is perpendicular to N hat, so we know that the dot product is equal to zero for that one. For two, V2, they're parallel, right? So it's equal to the magnitude of V2. And this should be a hint right now. We like this. This is fantastic. If we can draw our control volume such that our velocity is parallel to our unit normal on our control volume, the dot product becomes easy. Then it's either a positive or, moving on to part three, if the velocity is entering our control volume, then our um, it is the negative Mag a magnitude of V3. 
So if we can draw our control volume so that it is perpendicular to our, our unit norm, or sorry, draw our control volume so our unit normal is parallel to our velocity, the dot product becomes really easy and we can just say it's a negative or positive velocity. If we don't do that, then we have to do some shenanigans. And those shenanigans are sometimes like vector four where we have some the angle theta between our velocity and our unit normal and our dot product is going to be equal to the cosine of theta times the magnitude of v4. So this can get um, very complicated very quickly. Uh, if we have time and space varying velocities and when the unit vector varies with time and space. So you can imagine we have some unit normal that varies in direction, right? And then we have some velocity which is coming through like this, which is varying with time as well. So our unit normal is equal to some kind of function of x, y, and z, and possibly time. We can have a time varying control volume that we've defined. That's up to us. Our velocity is equal to some function of x, y, z, and t. And the dot product of those two can be quite difficult. We will try to avoid this by choosing low dimensional problems with simple surfaces and simply defined velocities. Okay? All right. So um, we're going to pause here just because um, it's good to take little breaks and get up and walk around. And our next video is going to talk about how we can make solving these problems easier. Um, we kind of hinted at it already. Choosing control volumes well helps tremendously. Um, but we'll go into detail about that in the next video. And we will solve a uh, example problem. Okay? Great.